the skills that brought me to this place had nothing to do with my academic credentials in mm. some ways. It was all about my lived experience. And those are the things that, that you shouldn't just shut down when mm. you enter this rarefied sort of, you know, arguably white male space in a lot of ways. Bring the things that make you different and don't apologize for those. Mm. I want to start actually with your Twitter profile. You describe yourself as um, a high school dropout, yes. chemistry professor at Reed College. So can you just like walk us through how you went from being a high school dropout to being a tenured professor at one <laughs> of the most prestigious liberal arts colleges in the country? Wow, that's, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think one of the first things I should say is that I am a child of two parents who are very hardworking, but uh, one had a high school education and that was enough. School of hard knocks is what she called it. You know, that was enough. Uh, and my dad is an immigrant from a very rural and poor area of Mexico, Nayarit. I grew up moving a lot, which I think is the thing when I talk about becoming a dropout, you know, um, people don't realize how disruptive that is to children, particularly if you have parents who are not necessarily home so it was, you know, babysitters or um, latchkey kid kind of thing. So, you know, the homework just didn't really get done. My parents didn't really, you know, know how to help with it. And so I really quickly, uh, early on in elementary school, just didn't think I was very bright because I was definitely, the teachers were kind of hard on me. Why isn't your homework done? Why do you look a little messy? You know, these kinds of things. And so that really persisted. And then we moved to a new school and in one very... Um, awful example, I, I went to a new school, we had moved, and the, that new school had just covered fractions, for example. Uh, I had never been taught fractions, so I never learned fractions as a result. That was just wow. part of the module that moved on. Yeah. So this kind of just kept snowballing until we moved yet again um, to in middle school, which is a really tough time, mm -hmm. um, settled a little bit, and then we moved again right before I started high school. So right around that time, you know, all I wanted was to belong. I wanted to feel safe. And right around that time, alcoholism and problems in my family were starting to really compound. And so it was just this perfect storm where I was falling through the cracks in my freshman year of high school. I, I barely passed anything. And then in my sophomore year, I was 15. Um, and I was just failing everything. I think I had a 1.8 GPA by the time that I just unceremoniously sort of dropped out of high school. And I ran away and um, just kind of was obviously struggling with my parents splitting up. I mean, there's a lot of factors and I'm open and vulnerable about this because I think that uh, it's not a kid's fault necessarily. And yet it's not necessarily your parents' fault either. These socioeconomic um, and ethnic sort of issues. My dad was constantly um, being oppressed in many different ways that really affected how he saw the world. And so it just all came together. And so ran away and then ended up getting together with someone that was a lot older. And I moved in with him because it was a lot of security at 16. Yeah. Um, and I just kind of joined food service. I became a dishwasher, worked my way up the ranks and I just figured that was going to be my career, just to be in food service. But I was really embarrassed by not having a high school diploma. And when I was looking for other work, I was kind of lying on my resume, you know, saying, oh, yeah, I got a degree, you know, got my high school uh, thing in Astoria. And then I thought, well, maybe I should think about getting my GED. And so I was by then about 23 or 22 but I got my driver's license at 22. So that was a big moment when everything kind of shifted. If I'm to think back to what happened, um, you have to study for it. You have to read the manual, you have to take the little test. And for the first time I really studied for something and I got, I got the, the license. And that was a huge amount of freedom because I was in a very, um, you know, not a good relationship. So that was this the moment same of feeling, one you were in at 16. Exactly. Yeah. And so at this moment, I started to feel this little spark of like, maybe this is the way I can kind of get out of this situation, you know, by and studying. So, yes. Of as studying. a way to, to get somewhere. 
Yeah, it just felt like studying gives you this independence that um, nobody can take from you. This yeah. idea of education being something that I could use and that nobody, not my partner, not the world, they couldn't take from me. And so I studied for a couple of months and I was impatient. I just wanted to do it. And so I took the GED test and then I was still working at my mother's restaurant as a waitress at the time. And Mr. Snow, who was the guy who oversaw the GED stuff, came into the restaurant came to the counter. He said, no, I know you're working, Kelly. I just had to share this with you. Uh, here is your GED. You got one of the highest scores in the state of Oregon this wow. year. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, what? And so they gave you this little $500 voucher, which for community college at the time, and you know, two th uh, what was it, 2001 or something, quite a bit. So um, I just decided to take Wait, they the gave you a voucher for the community college. They did. They said, oh, you can smart. use this. That's smart. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. And so they were like, you can use this. I thought, what the heck, you know, I'm going to do this. So I took philosophy 101 and college survival and success, which is one of the biggest things I tell all of my students, um, who are first gen or that are not traditional that course taught me how to study, taught me how to wow. read, yeah. skimming, scanning, highlighting, yeah. um, chunking your tasks into half an hour, you know, and yeah. then stopping and switching. All of those things, little did I know, um, gave me the cultural capital that I needed to at least get to the next step. So I went to Mount Hood Community College for a year. Um, and that was when I saw the biology lecture that really opened my eyes. And at the time, my family was not supportive of me continuing college. I remember I came to my work shift and my mom really, you know, she's very proud now, of course, and she regrets this, but she's like, well, is this going to get in the way of your work schedule? You know, like, uh -huh. I don't think you're really going to stick with this. And frankly, given my track record, I don't really blame her for thinking that, but I just kept going. Like, nobody's going to tell me it just felt really bigger than myself. And I think that a lot of students who are entering college, community college too, it's like, this is something bigger. And I thought I'd be a nurse. I thought that was reasonable. It would pay well, it's respectable. And I could get a pretty cool little education at the same time. And so that was really what I was going for. I thought that was the top. Yeah. But I was actually being told that I wasn't good enough for that, that I wouldn't get into a nursing school. Who did I think, wow. you know, who was telling when, you that your family, I mean, your family, but who it actually else? at the, the, it was actually at a community college that someone had said that, um, I think also just as a woman, you sort of get disregarded. Um, a lot of people want to be nurses and a lot of people, you know, want to do these things. And they're like, well, maybe think about like something like Apollo college or, you know, something like a, a sort of a trade thing. And I was like, no, I think I can do this. I've got straight A's so far, you know, I was take, I was up to calculus at that point. Like that was some, I thought math was great all of a sudden when I couldn't do fractions in the past. So anyway, um, essentially that was when I sat in on the lecture in biology, which was a prerequisite. It was a before, it doesn't count for a four-year degree or anything like that. It was just like, let me just see what biology is and see if that's something cool. And that opened up uh, the Miller-Urey experiment uh, of the origins of, you know, that was around the origins of life, the chemical origins of life. And they talked about that experiment and how the, you know, something like 14 out of the 20 amino acids uh, were present in the TLC. And, you know, at the time I didn't know all these details, but I thought, what is this? I have to know, you mean you can study the chemical origins of life. And I was like, chemical, you know, what, what is this? And somebody said, oh, well, it's chemistry. I decided instead of getting my associates to transfer at that moment, because Mount Hood was wonderful, but it's very far away. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, maybe I could go to a university and I talked to a couple of people informally and they said, well, yeah, you can, it's probably going to be hard, you know, and you're probably not, I didn't know that I could go and apply to colleges as a transfer student, you see. So the only option I thought I had was Portland State University, which I'm actually in retrospect, very grateful that I had access to. So, but I didn't know at the time with my 4.0, you know, that I could have probably applied a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really glad I didn't know, but at the same time, I want students to realize that they are good enough coming from a community college. So I think that that's really important. So then I went to Portland State and I attended my very first day. My very first lecture was chemistry. 
uh, Chemistry 221, which is like the four year equivalent, if you know something you can do. And it was a amazing woman chemist named Gwendolyn Schusterman, who I still know now. Um, and she was strong, her hair was short, she knew everything and it was intoxicating. Chemistry just <laughs> blew my mind. And that was really it. I started to pay attention to the department a little bit, even though it was a very big school. And I saw the professors and I thought, this is a dream job. I could oh. never get to this, but wow. it's a dream job. Yeah. So yeah. I just kept going. So I want to hear a little bit about your research. Can you explain yeah. it um, like to my grandma? Of course. I explained it to my grandma all the time. <laughs> um, okay. So like I said, so I kind of tried to preface it a little bit. I am really into the role that metals and particularly transition metals, which are in a certain spot of the periodic table, just means that they're a little bit more flexible with their electrons. Um, and can take on multiple states where they're missing some electrons and are still stable. And nature and evolution has used this difference in how many electrons it can have to do work. So every time that grandma takes a breath, um, she is using copper to basically split oxygen and produce H2O and, and, and CO2. And that goes on every single time you breathe in a process called respiration. So I was really obsessed with copper proteins in my PhD. And in particular, I was working on a protein called copper A, which is at complex four of the electron transport chain, this little electron moving, respiring thing. And we actually don't understand a lot about how the metals are. You eat some meat. How does that iron get to where it needs to go? to a baby protein that needs that iron to be installed? And then how is it being installed? What proteins travel along? Metals do not travel loose in your body. They are always being held captive because anything that has electrons can be a free radical. And that's very dangerous through popular culture. We know that. So this very tight control and sort of docking and leaving the, the metal at one spot, the protein with the metal moves to another spot. And then it finally makes it to its destination to say, copper A, this protein that I was studying. There are birth defects in babies who cannot actually assemble that protein and install the copper, for example. So there is a protein that is missing that's not doing its job of bringing that copper to the final destination and those babies pass away. So this was a question that we had about how does this copper center actually get matured? So you're studying things that have been interesting to people for a long time, but we have techniques that are available now. Yes, we basically can ping the metal, make it ring like a bell, and then look at how that reverberates through the protein. Oh, what a great and analogy. That, it, it, yeah, and it tells us when it reverberates back, we can deconvolute that and figure out what's bound to it. So one of the ways that my work um, sort of corners to other work is that I'm interested in bacteria like E. coli, like nasty E. coli, the kind when people say, don't eat this, you know, romaine lettuce. Well, that bad E. coli knows how to get through your bloodstream, through your stomach. Um, it gets into your bloodstream. And then the reason why you don't get better and people get very sick and millions of or thousands of millions of people get very sick and some die in a lot of different countries um, is because our body's efforts to kill those bacteria is unsuccessful because those bacteria have inv invented ways to resist what happens. And this is really interesting. So if you have that bad E. coli, gets into your bloodstream, something called a macrophage comes along, this big, it's a big eating machine and it'll come along and engulf that, that E. coli. It takes it to a killing chamber where yeah, internal to, organelle like, of the macrophage, the okay. killing chamber. Like I'm going to bring you into this really protected little chamber and I'm going to start barraging you with electrons by recruiting copper. So literally your macrophages will recruit copper ions through a lengthy process of having proteins that can handle and export it into that little killing chamber. And the E. coli begins to be barraged by... Um, by copper, that produces free radicals, electrons that happen that react with the uh, bacteria in a lot of different ways, but also copper will bind to their proteins in the E. coli and gum up the works. 
copper doesn't do the right job that iron would, but it got in there and it bound, and now the E. coli cannot live. Well, that's what would happen with a normal E. coli. The bad E. coli have efflux pumps that will immediately be turned on and literally get sucked out all of that copper like a straw out into back into the killing chamber and it survives. Uh -huh. So those export systems, those pumps that pump out these metals that we're using to try to kill them, if we can target those and understand the physical amino acids responsible uh -huh. Uh -huh. for recognizing and effluxing that copper. That's right. Yeah. Shut it down. And so if I can use my skills of that structural, like ringing that bell and singing where the copper or the silver is in that pump, well, we could possibly figure out a way to shut it down permanently by perhaps using a metal or a copper compound that would bind irreversibly. That won't hurt the human, but it will hurt the bacteria. And I got one more thing to show you. Oh, show me, show me. My dog. <laughs> His name is Devo, D-E-V-O, after Devo. the thing. Devo, hi Devo. He you look sleeping so hard. Tired. He looks like, why did you wake me up? <laughs> He doesn't know what he's doing. Aww. Zinnia, my cat, she just wants to, she wants to suckle my neck is what she wants to do right now. <laughs> Which I let her do, but not on camera. Yeah, not on camera. That's fine. Okay. <laughs>